My name is Donald Spivak. I am formerly the Deputy Chief of Operations for the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Los Angeles. I was with the Community Redevelopment Agency for close to 30 years spending much of that career working in uh, urban centers, including downtown Los Angeles, with a focus on Skid Row and other neighborhoods in downtown. Skid Row is an area in downtown Los Angeles that is generally east of the historic core and south of the Civic Center, bounded generally by 3rd Street on the north, 7th Street on the south, Main Street on the west, and Alameda Street on the east, covering approximately 50 blocks. It's a mixed industrial and uh, hotel housing area that is characterized by uh, uh, about 7,000 residential units, almost exclusively in SRO, single room occupancy hotels, missions, and shelters. The population of the area is about 15,000. About 12,000 of those people live in the hotels and the balance live in shelters, missions, or on the streets. Los Angeles was established by uh, Spanish, who arrived here in 1781 and found the area already inhabited by an indigenous population that had been here for approximately 10,000 years. The expedition had originated in Mexico City in 1769 and moved northwestward to try to pacify and stabilize this portion of New Spain. They arrived uh, in Los Angeles in 1781 and established themselves at the site of the indigenous community on the Los Angeles River. The settlement was established as part of the supply chain to serve the missions on either side of it, the San Gabriel Mission to the east and the San Fernando Mission to the north, the missions being the primary mechanism by which the Spanish exerted their control over the local populations. The primary purpose of the establishment of the missions and, of course, of the city of Los Angeles was to generate economic activity, primarily taking advantage of the agricultural uh, capacity of the land, but also to make sure that the indigenous population was converted to Catholicism. The area remained part of New Spain up until the point at which Mexico declared its independence from Spain in 1821, and it then became part of Mexico. It remained part of Mexico up until the Mexican-American War in 1848, when the ownership of the territory transferred to the United States. In the intervening years, there had been a substantial migration of primarily white settlers coming from other parts of the United States to the Pacific Coast. And they agitated for the area to become part of the United States, which ultimately led to the Mexican-American War. At the end of the war, uh, Los Angeles did become an American community. That was followed a year later by the discovery of gold in California, which led to a very large migration of Americans to the territories and uh, ultimately to the disenfranchisement of most of the remaining Spanish population, taking away many of their land rights and other things that had been guaranteed as part of the treaty that ended the War of uh, 1848. Los Angeles became part of the United States in 1848, and that was the result of a large migration of settlers into the area um, as part of the westward expansion of the United States. The flow of settlers tremendously expanded after the discovery of gold in California. And with a substantially increasing population of primarily white settlers, there was a movement to undo a lot of the promises that had been made to the Spanish who remained in Los Angeles, including taking away the rights that they had to continue to own and control land in the area. Shortly thereafter, the United States went through the Civil War. And one of the results of the Civil War was the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, which connected the East and the West Coast. The Transcontinental Railroad was largely driven from the East, and it linked the East Coast with what was then the only known destination, as far as Easterners were, were concerned, on the West Coast, namely San Francisco. And it was a group of local business people in Los Angeles who began to agitate shortly thereafter for an extension of the railroad to come to Los Angeles and they were successful in bringing a spur from Los Angeles. The physics of the railroads require that they come in on, as much as possible, a flat path. And so the railroad entered Los Angeles along the Los Angeles River, which is to the east of Skid Row, to a terminal roughly at the southeastern corner of the Skid Row area at the intersection of 6th Street and Santa Fe Avenue. The railroads primarily were servicing uh, agricultural product as the primary export from the area. 
And so it was a seasonal industry that required seasonal population to come in at the beginning of the growing season, at the end of the growing season. And so this brought the need for small hotels and other destinations for people who were going to be here on a transitional basis, a transitory basis. The type of people who came to Los Angeles looking for work tended to be young, single, adult males. And young, single, adult males, in addition to having a place to live, also wanted the different types of recreation, which led to the establishment of bars and brothels and uh, other types of facilities of that nature to serve their needs. That in turn triggered the coming of the temperance movement to Los Angeles to provide a clean living alternative to the bars and brothels that were naturally attracted by the population. And they in turn became the base of the missions and other social service organizations that now proliferate through the entire area. In the 1890s, petroleum was discovered in Los Angeles, and so that generated a substantial additional migration of workers coming to Los Angeles as a result of the discovery of petroleum, and hand in hand with that, the establishment of, of an automobile industry in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, in fact, became the second largest manufacturing center for automobile and automobile-related types of activities, second only to Detroit. Shortly thereafter, the film industry also came here largely because of the climate and the diversity of, uh, of scenery for the types of, of films that could, uh, that could be made or would be made. The railroads in the meantime had, um, in addition to being a transportation uh, activity, were also in the real estate business. So they promoted Southern California as a destination with clean air, wonderful temperatures, in fact, um, put into people's heads the idea that Southern California was paradise. When the United States ultimately then moved into the era of economic downturn, particularly the Great Depression, many people who were displaced, primarily in the Midwest, from their farms and their homes, had in their heads that Los Angeles was the place where the pot of gold existed at the end of the rainbow. And so they tended to migrate to Los Angeles looking for that second life. Some found it, others didn't. Some were able to return. Large numbers of them, among other things, alcohol addicted, were unable to make the trip back. They ended up living in railroad yards, railroad cars, under bridges, and ultimately in some of the smaller hotels around the train stations. That became um, less commercial and more residential hotels. And that was the beginning of the residential base in Skid Row of a permanent underclass living in this community. The next era of Skid Row to talk about is the era after the Great Depression, which was characterized primarily by a series of wars, the Second World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. Starting with the Second World War, there was a large migration of people coming to Los Angeles, first because of the jobs. Los Angeles, having emerged as an automobile-oriented manufacturing center, very quickly converted into the production of war materials. Large numbers of people came to Los Angeles for the jobs that were offered by the war, Plus, large numbers of people came through Los Angeles on the way to the, the war itself, primarily the war in the Pacific. And as they came through Los Angeles, they would be here for a couple of days. The social service organizations that had emerged originally from being part of the temperance movement into the mission movement adopted the USO and other military serving social service um, organizations. And so there was a growing base of uh, social services, primarily for military workers and those who came here as a result of the military attraction. One of the things to keep in mind is Los Angeles, by its own history, was in many ways a southern city. And so it was a segregated city. Large numbers of people coming to work in Los Angeles for the war were minorities. And they were only allowed to live in certain places, certain parts of the city. In particularly the Korean and most certainly in the Vietnam War era, large numbers of the military were made up of minorities. And so the fact that Los Angeles still had the sense of being a segregated city limited the areas of the city in which these uh, individuals uh, could live, could work, and so forth. Skid Row was one of those places that was a high tolerance community and was open to minorities. The population, however, changed. You had, as you had had during the Great Depression, a movement of people coming to Los Angeles um, to escape whatever they had um, originally been involved in. In the case of the Great Depression, the loss of homes and the loss of farms. In the case of the wars, having gone through Los Angeles to and from war fronts, and in many cases coming back 
with uh, ailments such as uh, stress disorders. You also saw a change in the population from a population that was largely alcohol dependent to a population that had been exposed to a much wider range of drugs, and so you had a drug dependent population. The fact that you had the social service entities in this area and the fact that you had a concentration of uh, a population that needed social services combined to make Skid Row change again in its complexion from a predominantly white, fairly benign, alcohol addicted population to a predominantly non-white, drug addicted, and much more violent population as the era of the, the various wars in the Pacific wound their way through Los Angeles. The next era in the evolution of Skid Row came in the 60s and 70s, and this was a follow-on to the recognition that the population in Skid Row had been changing, and in many people's minds changing for the worse, with the introduction of a larger and larger population of people that had um, mental illness and other types of addictions, making the area a relatively unsafe community. Businesses were moving out. The city began to notice that the area needed some type of attention. And the first thing the city did was to uh, try to upgrade the safety of the housing stock by a program of code enforcement. Now, unfortunately, when code enforcement goes in in the city of Los Angeles, an owner of a property is given a notice to either repair or to demolish a building. And unfortunately, a large number of the owners, particularly of the hotels, chose to demolish rather than come up with the money it took to repair the buildings. So in a very short period of time, roughly 10 years from the mid-60s to the mid-70s, almost half of the housing stock in the Skid Row area was demolished. The number of units went from roughly 15,000 to about 7,500. This coincided with a slow growth movement in Los Angeles when more and more communities were opposed to the development of new housing and so at the same time as housing was being eliminated in Skid Row, the amount of new housing that was being provided was going down. And so the cost of housing throughout the region was going up. And more and more people, particularly of lower income, were being squeezed in terms of the housing stock available to them. And that began very seriously to push people at the very bottom of the economic ladder out of housing altogether and onto the streets. The city then recognizing the fact that there was a growing population of people living on the streets and also seeing that at the same time in other parts of downtown there was a migration of businesses out of the downtown undertook to start redeveloping the central city. In the 1960s they began with an urban renewal program in Bunker Hill, the northwestern quadrant of downtown, which was a traditional uh, urban renewal project in which all of the buildings were acquired and demolished and all of the population was relocated. When it came time to deal with the Skid Row area, the city took a very different tack. And the tack in Skid Row was to try to preserve the stock of, of remaining housing, to stabilize the community, and to stabilize the availability of social services in this area. Now, this was, in one respect, a very forward-looking way of dealing with a very, very needy population. But it was not completely altruistic, because part of the idea was that if housing was stabilized and services were provided in the Skid Row area, then numbers of people wandering the streets, panhandling, and other parts of downtown could be constrained. And so part of the policy was what was referred to as a policy of containment, which really took two directions. One was to make sure that within the area of Skid Row, the housing and social service stock was preserved and not demolished, but at the same time to constrain the ability of people who needed those services and took part in those services were not moving freely around the rest of downtown so as to make it possible to promote the revitalization of other parts of downtown Los Angeles. The most recent era of the evolution of Skid Row is the era that we're in right now, starting in the 1990s and then moving into the current day. The 1990s saw an economic change in the United States that was a little different than those of previous years. For the first time, the economic recession of the 90s, in contrast to economic recessions in prior years, tended to really hit the middle class, and it tended to put out of work people who worked in offices as opposed to people who worked in factories or in small uh, businesses. 
And as a result of the economic boom that had preceded it, many people had invested heavily in housing or in cars or in other things, and they were kind of living from paycheck to paycheck. So as this recession began to hit heavily into the middle class, you saw families that had been living from paycheck to paycheck unable to continue to maintain their mortgages, unable to maintain their, their current um, style of living. Initially, the reaction was the traditional one in Skid Row. When there's an economic recession, individual males arrive looking for social services. But shortly thereafter, in the, the early 90s in particular, there was a proliferation of women and women with children beginning to arrive in Skid Row looking for social services. A population that traditionally had not been there and a population that at the same time was not accustomed to looking for social services. Now, for most of its history, the public policy in Skid Row had been, this is an area that is really suited for adult males. It is largely industrial. It is an area characterized by a lot of truck traffic. It is an area that has very few uh, public services such as, as parks. It has no schools. And so, as a matter of policy, it had always been seen as a community for adult males. This was further reinforcing the fact that it's a community it was an area that housed large numbers of people that had uh, problems of mental illness, substance abuse, physical and other handicaps. With the arrival of women and children though, the social service community itself began to diverge. Several of them believed that yes, the public policy that this was an adult only area made sense and that while it was important to provide intake services for women and children, they should as quickly as possible be moved to other neighborhoods. Others felt that now was the time to start looking at providing housing for families in Skid Row. At the same time, late 90s into the early uh, 2000s and up to the present time, there has been finally resurgence in a number of the communities that are closest to Skid Row. The historic core, long an area of abandoned office buildings, was coming back as an area of loft conversions. Little Tokyo was re-emerging as a mixed commercial and residential neighborhood to the north of Skid Row. To the east, the Artist District was coming back as a live-work community with uh, associated services, galleries, and the like. And so on a couple of sides of Skid Row, as we came through the, the, the 2000 era, there were uh, reinvestments taking place that were bringing residents back into communities that largely had been very unpopulated for many, many years. And these were then beginning to impinge physically on the boundaries of Skid Row. So that raised a number of public policy questions. The first question coming out of the fact that women and children had been arriving in the row was, did it make sense at this point to move away from the policy of Skid Row being predominantly or exclusively for adult males? Did it make sense to start looking at providing for families? Given that the housing to the west in the historic core, to the north in Little Tokyo, to the east in the artist district did not have uh, occupancy restrictions, did it make sense to say that if you lived on the west side of Main Street, you could have kids living with you, but if you lived on the east side of Main Street, you couldn't? And so that was a, a very serious public policy question. The other side of the issue is that among the population that you have in Skid Row are large numbers of people with mental illness, physical handicaps, substance abuse problems, um, histories of sexual abuse, histories of uh, child abuse, uh, largely because other laws preclude people with these histories from living in many other neighborhoods. So they tend to, con to concentrate in this particular community. You have large number of people emerging from prisons living in this community because, again, Skid Row is a community of high tolerance and these people are simply not tolerated in a lot of other neighborhoods. So could you successfully mix housing for families with this pre-existing population? A second question was, did it make sense to look at a broader income spread within Skid Row? Skid Row traditionally was for the extremely low income households, again, primarily individuals, and it was housing of last resort for this population. If you were to introduce a broader income mix, on the one hand, it would, pr it would provide more spending power so that certain basic retail services, for example, could exist. But on the other hand, it would tend to put pressure on some of the remaining housing stock that was not yet under public control to upgrade and up-price that housing and therefore reduce the supply of housing for the people at the very bottom of the economic ladder. So these were a couple of questions that uh, began to, to trigger 
in the last couple of years, the need to deal with, does it make sense to continue the public policies of the last several decades, or is it time to look at new public policies, particularly with regard to occupancy and with regard to the income spread of people in Skid Row? And the larger question is, what should be the future of Skid Row? Skid Row for a long time has served as the primary source of social services and housing of last resort for much of the region. Is it time that Los Angeles and Skid Row should begin to put more pressure on the rest of the region to decentralize those services and that housing so that other communities begin to pick up more of a share of low-income housing and services for people who need services? particularly since many of these people are coming from other parts of the region and they're concentrating in Skid Row because of the lack of services elsewhere. There's no question that Skid Row should continue to provide that level of housing and that level of, of services for its appropriate share of the regional population. But should it be the only answer in the region for extremely low, indivi uh, low income individuals and for individuals needing high levels of social support or should that be spread about? And that is integral to the question of, should the mix of families and adults change? Should the mix of income change? These are the questions that are confronting Skid Row as we move to the future.